My name is Barbara Fry, and I am the director of the Human Rights Program at the University of Minnesota. I'm pleased to join you to open tonight's program, which commemorates the 70th anniversary anniversary of the We Charge Genocide petition of the Civil Rights Congress, which documented systemic violations against black men, women, and children by the United States government. I'd first like to thank the organizers of tonight's event, particularly the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. We partner with the Human Rights Program and the Center on many events. And, um, and tonight's event is one that I, I feel is a, of particular timeliness and importance, and I'm, I'm grateful to the organizers. It's obviously an important moment for us to consider the lessons from this groundbreaking historical event. Lessons about ingenuity, resilience, and resistance which continue to be central to the ongoing struggles for racial equality and racial justice that we face in our own communities today. We cannot overlook the fact that we are touching on these themes on the very same day that Dante Wright's mother, Katie Bryant, has testified in a courtroom in Minneapolis about her son's killing at the hands of a police officer. The We Charge Genocide petition was addressed to the United Nations Commission on Human Rights in 1951. That commission was created by the United Nations Charter just six years before. And many civil rights groups lobbied, including African Americans and, and other activists from the United States, lobbied to include human rights as a core purpose in the United Nations Charter. It was indeed a monumental development that for the first time in human history, international law as set forth in the UN Charter actually recognized the rights of individuals and groups as against their governments. The Charter also established this new institution, the UN Commission on Human Rights, a body of of states that would determine how to promote and protect those rights. Those developments in the latter half of the 1940s after two world wars raised the hopes of oppressed people across the world, including the African-American people, that there might be some redress for the harms they had suffered for generations. Many petitions from individuals and groups began to pour in from around the world, documenting violations and seeking protection. While it would be many years before the UN Commission on Human Rights began to take action with regard to these appeals from victims, this particular petition, the We Charge Genocide Petition, had a powerful impact as it was directed at the most important post-war country in the world, the United States of America, a country which sought to position itself as the promoter of human rights, including equality based on race. The struggle to recognize the true extent of the violence and deprivations caused by systemic racism in the United States is still ongoing. But we should focus tonight on the courage of these early and creative activists. I look forward to hearing from our esteemed speakers tonight as they help us to learn not only about the work of activists for racial justice in the past, but of today and the future. Thank you very much for joining us. And it's my pleasure uh, now to introduce Shir Ganor, who is an assistant professor of history and on the faculty uh, with the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Thank you so much, Barb, for these important uh, opening words. Um, 
as uh, mentioned, um, I will be uh, introducing our uh, three esteemed speakers today. Um, and um, after uh, they will uh, uh, present their presentations, we will also still have time for a conversation. Um, and I'll ask um, uh, the audience, uh, if you want to ask a question during the Q&A discussion, please post your questions in the chat and I will collect them and address them to the, to the speakers. So I'm gonna start by introducing our first speaker this evening, Professor Douglas Irvin Erickson, who is a political theorist and a diplomatic historian specializing in international criminal law and justice. Uh, professor Ervin Erickson is Assistant Professor of Conflict Analysis and Resolution at the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter School at George Mason University. His first book, titled Rafael Lemkin and the Concept of Genocide, was published in 2017, and he's currently working on two book projects simultaneously. The first is titled Dying in the Age of Thoughtlessness, the Genocide Prevention and Peacebuilding Industrial Complex, which is a critical examination of how the global genocide prevention and peace building regimes take on their own rationale and exist to justify their own existence. And the second book that he's working on uh, is an intellectual biography of Martin Luther King Jr. Professor Irving Erickson is also a senior fellow uh, with the Alliance uh, for Peace Building, a board member of the Institute for the Study of Genocide, uh, and uh, a member of the editorial board of Genocide Studies and Prevention. Professor Douglas Erickson, uh, uh, Irving Erickson. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here tonight. And um, I am I'm really you know, happy that this, is, this event could come together on this really important anniversary. Uh, Shir and Barbara, thank you for the invitation. And just a quick word to Tim and Angela. It's really great to, uh, to be on a panel with you. Um, you know, Tim, your scholarship is is legendary amongst my circles, and Angela, you are a rising star, and I'm really excited to to see where that star sort of catapults upward. What's the metaphor? I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there before I mix up all my metaphors, but it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen real quickly, and I've got um. I shared a PowerPoint, I've shared the, the PDF of this PowerPoint slide with Sheer, and I can ask you maybe some, or I can put it in the chat and it's there for your taking. Um, and can everybody see the screen so far? Got it? Yes. All right. So I just wanna set the stage here a little bit and sort of point out that there's actually been a lot of really good work on the We Charge Genocide pamphlet. And if you scan, and I'm going to draw on this and I'll sort of, you know, return to the slide at the end, but I, I just want to point this out for any uh, students that are in the, the room tonight. This is, this would be a great place to start if you're writing a paper. That top row on the top is sort of text that deal with the, uh, the actual substance of the petition. And, uh, and William Patterson's autobiography is just fantastic. He titled it The Man Who Cried Genocide. Um, and then there's a couple of journal articles that I've got bullet points there. And in that row on the bottom, uh, some scholarship that deals with the, uh, with, uh, you know, sort of not directly the We Charge Genocide, but I think is, is relevant to the conversation. All right. So I'm going to talk here about where this pamphlet came from and the context that it emerged from in the 1950s. And that story begins with Raphael Lemkin, who created the word genocide. And I put this here because, you know, this comes from the book I wrote, but also there's a really important story here that that's tied to the practice of being a historian, uh, which is, you know, I, when I wrote this book on Lemkin, I wasn't just looking at the official documents the United Nations was producing. I was looking at the personal letters that were being sent and the unwritten things that the sort of the, 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 the kind of correspondence that gets passed along and, and passed through and um, through different channels. These, these are notes that get passed to people in hotel rooms or formal letters from offices cables, birthday cards, and so forth. And they sort of find their home to different archives. And the thing that I want to emphasize here is that they tell a radically different story of history than the official documents that the United Nations produces. And that's important because international lawyers, historians, mainly of international relations, inter international relations theorists, they rely on those official documents. However, those official documents 
miss the kinds of things that are happening behind the scenes, specifically if you're talking about the kinds of things that get noticed and are important and are said amongst people whose voices tend to be marginalized in the first place. And that's because the person sitting in the room is taking notes. And there's, and, and there's no guarantees that that person who's taking notes on the official meetings and the minutes of the meetings is going to be able to spot the, the kind of subtle uh, things that emerge in conversations. And they're especially not going to spot the things that people decide not to say in the forum of the negotiations, because the negotiations that have actually happened have occurred behind the scenes long before people show up at the meeting. Um, a good diplomat does not walk into a meeting and does not know the vote count. They know the votes before the meeting. So a lot of times the things that are spoken is sort of a choreographed record. Now, why is this important? Here's some stuff from Lemkin. I like pictures. Lemkin was learning Chinese uh, at the end of his life. Anyway, pictures are fun. Um, this is, that scribbling there is the first time that he wrote the word genocide. And that's 1941, which is crucial because that's before the final solution. Um, that, that page there. All right, so an exercise I like to do with my students. Take a look at Lemkin's first definition of genocide. Genocide is the destruction of ethnicities or nations. A colonial process, genocide has two phases. First, the destruction of the national patterns of the oppressed. Second, the imposition of the national patterns of the oppressor. Now he defined nations as families of mind. And he's drawing on a rich history here of Polish and Russian and Belarusian, that you get in the weeds pretty quickly, uh, Belarusian social theory and legal theory that did not define nations according to the concept of a nation that emerges in English and French political philosophy, and then therefore kind of culture, right? So nations are aspects of consciousness. They're brought into existence. They're constantly changing. And most importantly, people can belong to many nations at once. Lemkin gave an interview at the end of his life, said, I, am, I belong to seven, eight nations, maybe, probably 12. Um, he saw them as, as, as big and small units uh, and so forth. And in this text, he actually said that genocide could be committed against gamblers and card players and union breakers. Um, now look at the definition that we get in the law, right? Article two of the Genocide Convention defines genocide as, right, any of these kinds of acts, any attempt to destroy and hold them in part, um, killing, you know, this is really crucial here, national, ethnic, racial, or religious groups as such. So how do you go from genocide as destruction of nations as a colonial crime to this right there? Right. This is, you know, destruction of national, ethnic, racial, religious groups through these five things. Well, you get there through the diplomatic history. And what I, what I really wanted to emphasize here is that there is no possible way the Brits or the Americans or, and then the French are working behind the scenes because they've got a lot of sort of diplomats that are working out here. There's no way that they're going to get behind a, a document that's going to outlaw colonial crimes. And this is exactly what Lemkin had in mind. And so these are the chief and uh, sort of opponents of the Genocide Convention. The, the Brazilian diplomat Gilbert Amado said, if you outlaw genocide, you will be committing genocide against Latin Americans because it is in our culture to exterminate our political opponents. Uh, Andrei Vyshinsky was, uh, had denounced Lemkin as an enemy of the Russian Revolution way back in 1931. He wanted nothing to do with the Genocide Convention. And then Hartley Shawcross was starkly opposed to it. Um, and wanted nothing to do with this. And so what you get then is a compromise document. And these, of course, were Lemkin's uh, great allies. Um, and so Pakistan I and mean, India emerge as a great supporters of the convention, along with Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia. E the Egyptian delegation is Lemkin's, uh, Lemkin's sort of voice in the room uh, and a whole set of interesting people. Now, Lemkin, at the end of his life, views the, the, the legal text as a total failure. He sees his life work as an absolute failure. Uh, he sees the law as being produced, like really, really politically produced in order to not work and, it, and to undermine the very purpose of what he was getting at. And he has these quotes here. I mean, this is, you know, this is just sort of haunting in his autobiography. Um, and he, that last one there, the fate of the genocide convention was now in the hands of statesmen who live in perpetual sin with history and treat life like currency in a bank. And he begins the second sort of part of his, uh, well, I wouldn't say second, but after, you know, after the Genocide Convention is enshrined in 48, he begins this process of trying to outlaw genocide 
under the domestic constitutions and domestic penal codes of different countries around the world. And it continues this to 53 all the way to 59. So the reason why there's a genocide convention in Cambodia and Argentina is because Lemkin worked with those delegates to help write that um, long after they had been delegates, they returned back to their countries and he worked within the context of their legal systems. He also in 51 to 53 attempted to prosecute uh, the League of, uh, prosecute French officials with the League of Arab delegates to, for committing genocide against Muslims in Algeria. Um, he called this the great, the great genocide of Muslims, which followed the great genocide of Jews. Uh, he saw this as a worldwide genocide, uh, looked specifically at the British mandates and, and saw the British mandates as being genocidal. Um, and he wrote a lot about race. Right. This was this was a huge part of this. He he viewed the, the American experience uh, as being united because he was Polish. So North and South America, Latin America. This was he saw this as a, as a racial, explicitly racial genocide. But he viewed race as nothing but a proxy for class and, and, and sort of a, and a way of exerting domination amongst two groups of people. So the question is, we, what about we charge genocide? And this is the great uh, contradiction and irony, sad point in Lemkin's life, is that actually he argues against uh, we charge genocide quite forcefully. And this is the heart of what I want to get at here. So Paul Robeson, of course, was the, the co-author, uh, one of the co-authors of this. Um, this is a couple of silent co-authors. W.E.B. Du Bois is another. Uh, but William Patterson is sort of the author on the face of it. Um, and this is picture of Robeson submitting this in New York. Now, now Du Bois submitted this petition in Paris and that, that prompted uh, the US uh, embassy in Paris to request that French authorities seize his passport, which would have prevented, prevented him from returning back to the United States. So this was significant enough for the United States to try to use this as an excuse to lock Du Bois in Europe in permanent exile. And, that, and it's after he submits the petition three days later that he's named an efficient agent provocateur with, and just basically a terrorist agent, an enemy of the United States um, that sets in motion the whole process that leads to Du Bois' exile. Um, the United States was watching this and there's whole sets of letters back and forth that, um, that the United States wanted nothing to do with the Genocide Convention. They had felt from the very beginning that it could be applied to the history of racial violence uh, and also the treatment of Native Americans. And the United, and part of what I was showing in my book is the United States was actually attempting to, to undermine it behind the scenes. Um, and so they were watching all along. And of course, if Du Bois is submitting this petition, this is going to, uh, U.S. Uh, you know, diplomats will be aware of this. Uh, anyway, so what Lemkin was trying to do at this moment here was suddenly he was faced with his own dilemma. And this is where the lesson of race and international law becomes so important. The Genocide Convention had by 51 been identified in the United States as a communist supported plot, right? That's crucial. And that has to do with, with a lot of the geopolitical jockeying between the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc in the United States. But Eisenhower has personal letters where he's writing about just the absolute shock that he got that from his own Republican party um, at the backlash of all of his work with the United Nations, because Eisenhower had sort of constructed a huge part of his political identity as liberating the Nazi camps. And he was personally willing to champion and ratify the, the genocide convention. But at this point, the US a delegation and the US had signed it at the UN, but the US did not ratify it, the Senate did not ratify it all the way until the Reagan presidency. And Lemkin is sitting here trying to figure out how do I get the United States to ratify this treaty? And so what you get is Lemkin begins to then think that he's going to go to the, the Eastern European diasporas, of which he also is a member, and he's going to present the Genocide Convention as a great tool against communism. And he's got this great you know, thing in his back pocket, which is I have already been denounced as an enemy of the revolution by Vyshinsky. Vyshinsky was Stalin's lawyer who orchestrated the show trials. And then the, then, the, then, the, then the prosecutor general of the Soviet Union and later the UN ambassador uh, for the Soviets. So he's got that. I've already been denounced, right? And they already tried to kill me when the Nazis and when Hitler and Stalin carved up Poland. I was wanted on both sides of the borders. Um, what Lemkin also kind of is missing in all of this is that 
is that this had, this had already been identified as a danger to the United States, specifically on this matter of race. And there was no way that he was gonna get that movement to sort of to, to generate itself. So what does Lemkin do? He doubles down on saying that the Genocide Convention has nothing to do with racial politics. And he writes a series of, of scathing editorials in the New York Times in public, denouncing them as crazies, as communists. Paul Robeson is a communist. Don't listen to him. Right? And he begins actually quite an incredibly racist public display. And I've got, you've never seen this one before. This, this, is, how, this is how you know Doug has gone full professor. So, <laughs> so this is for any students if you want to see what I wrote, right? You want to, I don't know, whatever. I, Put the PDFs there, you can see them. I got several pages on my book about this. Uh, let's just skip past that. Um, so what Lemkin does is there's like, Ch Ch Oakley Johnson writes this letter to Lemkin and says, have you not understood right, what it means to, to, to watch the lynchings right, happen in your hometowns? Have you not understood what, it, what the degradation? And he lists, he goes on and he lists, goes through Jim Crow and, and the whole history of segregation. It's, unbelievable. He talks about his own personal family. And Lemkin writes an editorial in the New York Times. So he gets a personal letter from this guy. And then he shares that letter in an editorial for the New York Times, right? To say this man's crazy, right? And reveals all this stuff. And he just keeps doing this over and over and over again, every single time trying to appeal to a white power structure. And so what you get here is this, this sort of this, this really sad and kind of like you, you know, you're, you're writing a biography of Lemkin, you're researching this, this guy's life and you admire him, admire him, admire him. That, this, is, this is brutal. And, and that's, that's the part that is really, really important here is, that, the, is that, that Lemkin understands that international law is a function of domestic politics. He gets it. So he decides to ally with a white power structure, thinking that if he can prove that his law is anti-Black, then it will be seen as pro-white and therefore you can get the United States government to ratify it. What he misses, totally misses, number one, is that he himself is not viewed as, as white in those terms. Uh, the senator from New Jersey gave a scathing speech said, why should we listen to a man who represents the first people who committed genocide in the world, the Jews who committed genocide against Christians. And why should we listen to, I'm not, that's not my position, that's that senator saying that. Uh, why should we listen to that guy, right? And he can't even speak English without an accent, right? And these are the kinds of things that the U.S. Senate is denouncing on the floor of the Senate, right? And so Lemkin is sort of missing this, right? He's also missing that this is the movement in the United States that is actually taking his ideas most seriously outside of his own Jewish diaspora communities. This is the movement. And there's a long history here. I mean, Carol Anderson, I think, is probably the best historian so far, writing on the history of the human rights struggles. Now, I could have offended somebody if people have their other favorites, um, but sorry about that. But anyway, I, I think her, her books, Bourgeois Radical and Eyes Off the Prize, are fantastic. And so this is, this is a moment here where there's actually a strong movement. And Lemkin, nevertheless, joins this larger sort of uh, sort of force of siding with whiteness against blackness in order to try to preserve human rights and international law. And that's the part that's just like stunning when you, when you read that um, and you sort of come across. All right, my clock says I'm at 15 minutes. I'm at my thank you. I want to just, you know, to sort of, if I can take 30 more seconds, I will say that, you know, Lemkin in his private letters, in, his per in the books that he was writing, views I, exactly the case in the terms that William Patterson laid out. So Lemkin, at the same time that he's doing all that, was writing a book about genocide against Black Americans in American history, and it's identical to Patterson's case. And that's the part where you just, you know, you just want to like kind of scratch your head, because at the same time he's writing these public denunciations of this, he's also writing his manuscript on the world history of genocide, where he considers that. And that's the complexity of, of human beings, individuals. That's the, the grayness in individuals. Was Lemkin a racist? Well, obviously we should consider that question. Um, but he, but, but what, what does that mean when he's willing to publicly betray his own values and, and so forth? So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of directions to go there.
and I will uh, I will turn it over to my uh, my my better esteemed colleagues. Thank you so much, Doug. This was uh, a a really great opening for our conversation. Um, I uh, particularly appreciate you um, putting an emphasis on how. Uh, the Civil Rights Congress and, and uh, other African-American-led organizations were um, the first to uh, seriously engage with, uh, with the convention in this way. Uh, the petition we charge genocide is being presented to the UN only um, a few months after it has become enforceable international law, and that is very significant. All right, um, next, uh, our second speaker in uh, this evening's panel, um, H. Timothy Loveless Jr. is a professor of law at Duke University where he teaches courses in American legal history, constitutional law and race and the law. Loveless's scholarship examines how the civil rights movement in the United States helped to shape international human rights law. And he's published articles and journals, including the Law and History Review, the American Journal of Legal History, and the Journal of American History. His forthcoming book, The World is on Our Side, the U.S. and the U.N. Race Convention, examines how U.S. civil rights politics shaped the development of the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. Professor Lovelace, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you so much um, for the warm introduction, uh, Professor Ganoa. Also, thank you to Professor Fry, um, the Center, um, the Human Rights Program, and then obviously my, my fellow panelists. Um, so in 1951, as uh, Professor Irvin um, Erickson has told us, the Civil Rights Congress submitted what they recognized at that time, the subtitle, as a historic petition to the United Nations, right here charging genocide. And I think that it's important for us to understand when this petition emerged. And it emerged at a critical juncture in the Cold War, where the United States and the Soviet Union are both fighting for the hearts and minds of the third world, where the US was being asked time and again, how can you talk about democracy abroad when democracy was not being practiced at home, that racism was America's Achilles uh, heel on this global stage. And so uh, the Civil Rights Congress's petition followed appeals by the NAACP and the National Negro Congress. But what was so different about the Civil Rights Congress's petition was that it was not simply a list of general grievances, it was that there was a specific charge here, a genocide, that there had been an intention here to cause serious bodily injury, um, mental harm, and that there had been killings of members of um, a group here, African Americans. And so this petition was indeed historic. It would change the direction of the Civil Rights Congress, and indeed, it would change the civil rights movement forever. But despite the historic nature of this petition and this attempt to tell the truth about American racism on this global stage, the effort was not without major obstacles and questions that we should ask as scholars. The, that Patterson here in the Civil Rights Congress were clear. The United Nations, lack jurisdiction to intervene in domestic affairs. In other words, the UN couldn't pass laws right, to directly impact the conditions facing African-Americans. And some scholars um, have rightfully questioned whether the Civil Rights Congress was critical enough of the Communist Party and the Soviet Union. And then this question of success in and of itself, right? How do you measure success? If you measure success, through a linear causal chain leading to the end of racism in the criminal justice system or racism in any other area of public life in the United States, someone might argue easily that the petition was ultimately a failure. But I think that if we have a more complicated idea of what success in social movements means, we might come to different conclusions. And I wanna talk about those different conclusions today, taking a broader social movement perspective of what the Civil Rights Congress did in 1951. 
one of the major things that they did was that they challenged this idea of American exceptionalism. And American exceptionalism, we need to understand, is a myth. Right? It's a myth that America's values and its political and economic systems are inherently superior to all other countries, and that the U.S. should be normatively the unquestioned leader of the world on the world stage, that the U.S. is indeed a shining city on a hill, that it's the best and last hope on earth. What the Civil Rights Congress did was that it challenged American exceptionalism as a way to advance racial equality under law. And I wanna talk about three ways that the Civil Rights Congress challenged American exceptionalism in service of the fight for racial equality. The first way, what the petition showed was that human rights violations were not simply something happening outside of US borders but human rights violations were also occurring inside U.S. borders. That Justice Robert Jackson from the U.S. Supreme Court, he helped to lead the prosecution of Nazis during the Nuremberg trials. And Jackson was on the world stage describing the horrors of the Holocaust to the world in powerful and often stunning language. This prosecution of Nazis was no doubt important. But the Civil Rights Congress said that genocide was not simply something that had happened in Europe, that genocide was happening in places like South Africa, and that genocide was also happening in the United States, that Blacks were facing a premature death, to use the words of the Civil Rights Congress, and that this premature death should be understood as not simply a domestic issue, but also as an international issue. What the Genocide Convention was doing is that it was giving William Patterson and the Civil Rights uh, Congress a legal and social yardstick to measure America's ostensible commitment to equality. That the convention here gave a new and very legal way for Blacks to ask a question that had been at the core of the Double V campaign coming out of World War II. Again, how can America talk about democracy abroad and not practice it at home? And for Patterson and the Civil Rights Congress, genocide here was not simply about mass killings. It was also about an economic form of genocide, that Blacks had been deprived of adequate medical care, education, and housing, that there had been segregation on buses, restaurants, theaters, and even segregation in cemeteries, even in death, Black people were segregated. Here, this human rights framework was important because it contained a critical vocabulary, a moral power, and a legal framework to confront legal inequality, but also to talk about education, housing, health care, and the employment needs of Black America. One way to think about this is, is this. Racism was not simply a civil rights issue, it was also a human rights issue. Second, the petition illustrated that white supremacy evolves over time. I really wanna emphasize this point, right? that white supremacy evolves over time. The conventional account of US race relations holds that racial progress is inevitable. Once we had slavery, Slavery was bad, then we had Jim Crow and the rise of lynchings in the formal sense. But by the mid 20th century, according to this master narrative of the civil rights movement, race relations weren't perfect, but there was no more transatlantic slave trade. That extrajudicial lynchings were still a thing, but the numbers weren't as high as they had been maybe a half century ago. And that there were now 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments. Again, America was not where it wanted to be, but it was better than what it used to be. What the petition showed was that something right, far less savory was happening, that white supremacy was indeed durable. It was persistent and it changed over time. The Civil Rights Congress's petition declared that lynching had been one way. That was the classic um, the classic way of, of killing Blacks had been 
lynching using a rope. But by the mid 20th century, there was a new method. It was a policeman's bullet. And according to the petition, right, the American police were the most visible representatives of this lynch mob. That the killing of African Americans had become police policy. Right? And it was the most practical expression of government policy. Right? That there were legal lynchings that were occurring. Right? So Blacks didn't need to be strung up outside of courthouses. This practice had been formalized in Martinsville, Virginia, for example. There had been African Americans who had been uh, accused of rape that they had never committed, but they were executed in this electric chair and that this was legal lynching. And that racism was not simply a Southern issue, it was a national issue, that the Great Migration had exposed this. Today, we have to think about white supremacy evolving over time. That many people today would say there's been a civil rights movement. There was Brown versus Board of Education. That there was a Civil Rights Act of 1957, of 60, of 64, a Voting Rights Act of 65. That the civil rights movement had moved us from these darkest days of Jim Crow. And then Barack Obama was elected president. And that had swept away the last racial barriers in American politics. And if America had not gotten to this racial promised land under Obama, the election of Kamala Harris was another sign of America moving in this right direction. This again is another teleological reading of racial progress over time. But the lesson for us as we understand the Civil Rights Congress and even today is that white supremacy did not expire with the rise of the civil rights movement or even right, celebrated 21st century elections. It exists today in meaningful structural ways that perhaps one might argue that there are racist problems less pronounced today than in the past. We have to challenge the master narrative and say that there are other racial problems that continue today, even if only in altered form, and in fact, in a more pronounced way. For example, more Black people are in U.S. prisons now than at the time of the We Charge genocide petition. How far have we come? Finally, what this petition encourages us to do is to say that freedom dreams might cost you personally, even if they are collective gains. Again, in the master narrative of American race relations, it might be easy to tell a very neat story filled with triumph that we have indeed overcome. But the story of William Patterson, Paul Robeson, and we can add Du Bois to this, is that as they were raising profound questions about American racism, that they were engaged in a certain kind of Socratic questioning of American racism. Right. Both socially and legally, they faced incredible backlash. Patterson was stripped of his passport and publicly scorned for allegedly aiding the Soviet cause. Robeson, right. too, found himself on America's political margins. He, was, he had been the darling of Black America, but he was summoned before the House Un-American Committee. He lost his passport and he was blasted in the press right. for his reported ties to the Reds. And then Du Bois, this towering intellectual, the NAACP co-founder and Pan-Africanist, as he petitioned the UN and charged the US with violating African-Americans' human rights, he too was scorned. In fact, he was kicked out of the organization he had hoped to found four decades earlier. And so today, like yesterday, we need truth tellers. We need people who understand that there might be consequences for raising profound questions. But as people of good conscience, we always have to tell the truth in public. This country needs a full reckoning about racism as it relates to mass incarceration, as it relates to January 6th, as it relates to the assault on voting rights, 
as it relates to the economic conditions that condemn African Americans and indeed many people of color to a caste system. We cannot build the democracy we need if we cannot be honest about the one we have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Lovelace, for these um, forceful and, and urgent words. Uh, and I think you, you ended on a, a, a really helpful note here because we are transitioning now to our uh, last presentation from a truth teller. Uh, and it's my honor to present uh, Angela Rose Myers, uh, our final speaker this evening. Uh, Angela Rose is the president of the Minneapolis NAACP. And she's also currently uh, pursuing an MA degree in the human rights uh, uh, program at the University of Minnesota. Uh, after she graduated from Barnard College in uh, New York City, Angela Rose, who's a Twin Cities uh, native, returned to Minneapolis uh, to uh, uh, make a change in her community. Um, and after uh, um, connecting with the Minneapolis NAACP, NAACP she quickly uh, rose to uh, uh, the ranks and uh, at the uh, age of 25 has been elected uh, president of the organization, uh, which makes her one of the youngest NAACP adult branch presidents in the entire country. Angela Rose has worked uh, with and built relationships with uh, many organizations on the local, uh, state, and national level. Uh, she has traveled around the world engaging scholars on social justice issues and public policy, uh, most notably helping coordinate the Fifth World Conference on uh, Racial and Ethnic Economic Inequalities in Victoria, Brazil. As a social justice advocate and researcher, Angela Rose's goal are to create bridges between grassroots organizing, public policy, and critical race theory scholarship. Angela Rose, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, and thank you so much for having me. Again, I just want to reiterate how grateful I am to be on this panel with such amazing scholars as Dr. Lovelace and Dr. Irvin Erickson. I want to thank um, uh, Professor Fry and um, Professor Ganor for inviting me, thinking of me, and the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies for having me tonight. So, um, as stated, you know, uh, previously. Previously, I am an activist and a scholar, but first and foremost, I'm a Black woman in America. And in this situation, particularly as a truth teller and as someone who wants to highlight uh, the work that Black Americans have done to advance human rights for our community, but also for communities across the world, I wanted to center my uh, presentation this night on just that, on histories of um, Black American um, activism on international scale and then how we can really utilize lessons learned from um, instances like the appeal uh, to the world that the NAACP and W.E.B. Du Bois submitted to uh, the UN and you know the We Charge genocide. So I'm going to share my screen. So um, let me let me know if you can see what I'm sharing. Okay so Perfect. The UN, you know, so this title actually came in out of uh, a conversation that I was having with uh, a community member about a year ago. And this was something where uh, a number, I work with a number of families, so, uh, specifically families that work with, uh, to prevent police violence and support other families that have been um, directly impacted by police uh, racially motivated murders in Minnesota. And, and so um, in that conversation, uh, we were talking about the UN and essentially how the conversation went was the UN, you know, what can they do for us? You know, what can they do for Black America? And to really get the uh, the kind of the tone of the conversation going, I put in this meme of Soldier Boy of uh, being asked about Drake. And if that goes over your head, it's okay. But it's basically um, something of the UN, you know, this is uh, the UN is such of an organization that seems so far from the everyday life of Black Americans that even bringing up the UN in the context of real 
change for the lives of Black Americans today, it seems like a faraway promise, a faraway, uh, you know, a, a, a shot in the dark. And so, you know, for me, my interests are definitely on um, political, Black political movements and different political contexts and throughout the world and history. And my activism manifests with a policy focus on, on change for Black Americans, but also a focus on Black movement building. And so when I was thinking about how has Black um, activists historically approached international institutions and for what reason, my first initial um, thoughts went to the abolition movement. And so since the abolition movement, since the abolition movement, Black Americans have been on the forefront of um, really seeking international recognition of the uh, plight of Blacks in the new world, but also seeking opportunities for themselves. So um, when it comes to even like Phyllis Wheatley, who has a picture here, um, she went to England to publish her poetry. And then while in England, um, two uh, uh, folk abolitionists, William and Ellen Craft, published their account, Running a Thousand Miles to Freedom, which documents their escape from slavery, when which entailed Ellen, a light-skinned, enslaved Black woman, donning a character of a sickly white man traveling with his dedicated slave. So that's how they were able to uh, emancipate themselves was through characterization and through particularly Ellen's light-skinned privilege of looking white. Um, and so that was one of the the ways that they were able to escape. They escaped to Boston and then further, they fled the US because of the uh, Fugitive Slave Act. They were afraid of being captured. And so they fled the US to Nova Scotia and then to England. And in doing so, they were fighting for the um, revocation of the Fugitive Slave Act, as well as for their freedom and for abolition for all peoples. They were looking at internationally how to appeal to an international audience through their part personal narrative and through the media. Uh, Frederick Douglass is another person who's traveled to Europe after the publication of his autobiography. His travels did not only raise awareness for the issues of slavery and in the American South, but also shaped his own species and his own abolitionist move um, activism. And then lastly, I have Ida B. Wells. After the ending of slavery, Ida B. Wells uh, published The Red Record in the 1890s, and she traveled internationally on lecture tours, speaking out against lynchings as documented in The Red Re Record, which, you know, she documented the lynchings in the South just so in such detail, giving numbers and giving statistics to what folks know anecdotally happens. She showed that in uh, 1890, uh, 1892, there was 241 lynchings in 1893, 156. And she detailed the extra ju uh, judicial uh, lynchings, particularly there was one in um, 1893 where a man was found innocent he was found innocent of murder. And then a week later, a mob came and lynched him. And she showed not only just the acts of lynchings, how they would lynch, um, as she would put it, imbeciles, you know, folks who are um, a, a disabled, different, um, you know, neurodivergent. She also showed how uh, they would lynch uh, particularly men who were um, accused of rape of white women and also folks who had no, there was no alleged crime. They were just lynched. And there was, as she shows even in her documentation, um, the lynchings of where it says no alleged crime. And so that was one of the things that really stuck out for the international community to know and to hear and to see this and also in the North as well. And she didn't just um, talk about the circumstances around the lynchings, but also that these lynchings did not take place in the dark with a few evil spirited clan members, right? These lynchings, a lot of them took place on Sundays after church to crowds of thousands. And in the red record, Wells even talks about a, a case where the trains were overflowing because so many spectators were coming into town to witness the lynching of a black man. And so, you know, that was some of the accounts um, that uh, Wells 
calls brought to an international audience and to detail them, um, you know, to very much detail them to that audience shows her uh, thinking of not just thinking about lynchings as something that happens, but how to utilize media and this publication of the Red Record for a broader audience to make a change to end the practice, the horrible practice of, uh, and deplorable practice of lynchings. And she wrote this in a way where you, you saw the facts and you saw her passion come through as a black woman during this moment. So my next uh, movement, I'm gonna go to the Niagara movement. The Niagara Movement first met in Ontario as a political formation of Black men, including Frederick McGee, a Black Minnesotan trailblazer. Um, so I'll sprinkle in Black Minnesota history in this presentation because that's what lights my fire too. Um, so the Niagara Movement was looking to agitate politically and legally for social equality and their declaration of pr principles. They make a number of broader calls to 20th century civilization, all men of all races. They speak out against oppression and they situate their call within a broader frame of human brotherhood and believe that they, uh, they to bring a light to such injustices that they do bring uh, forward is their duty as to be worthy of freedom. And with that section, it reads, oppression, we repudiate the monstrous doctrine that the oppressor should be the sole authority as to the rights of the oppressed. The Negro, Negro race in America is stolen, ravished, degraded, struggling through difficulties and oppression, needs sympathy and receives criticism, needs help and is given hindrance, needs protection and is given mob violence, needs justice and is given charity, needs leadership and is given cowardice and apology, needs bread and is given a stone. This nation will never stand justified before God until these things are changed. In agitation, they say, they. There's a little brief uh, paragraph about the church that I took out, but it's in there too. They're, they're talking about the church too. Um, and agitation, they say, the above grievances, we do not hesitate to complain, to complain loudly and insistently, to ignore, overlook, or apologize for these wrongs is to prove ourselves unworthy of freedom. Persistent, manly agitation is the way to liberty. And toward this goal, the Niagara Movement has started and asked the cooperation of of all men of all races. So they're calling on this larger notion of rights. You know, the framework of human rights hasn't really been fleshed out in the same way that we see a half century later. The notions of genocide have not been, the term genocide had not been um, constructed. The Niagara Movement was predates the NAACP. It predates the UN and even the treaty, um, the uh, Paris Convention. So there are, that that is the work that these um, men were particularly doing at the turn of the century to uh, amplify their not only their grievances but a call to action. And so, out of the Niagara Movement comes the NAACP. The founding of the NAACP really starts after the Springfield race riots and an interracial coalition uh, founded the NAACP with white women, white, uh, white men, um, black men and uh, black women, namely W.B. Du Bois and Ida B. Wells, who I've mentioned and you've heard Du Bois mentioned earlier. And so the original mission of the NAACP was to promote equality of rights and eradicate caste or race prejudice among citizens of the United States, to advance the interest of colored citizens, to secure them impartial suffrage, and to increase their opportunities for securing justice in the courts, education for their children, employment according to their ability, and the complete equality before the law. Now, I wanted to highlight this because that is a different, slightly different mission than what is put forward during the appeal. And one of the things about the appeal to the world when put forward uh, uh, in front of the UN 
they are not just looking at the rights of Black Americans, they are also working in coalition with African descendants across the world. And so one of the things that uh, has changed, uh, you know, very fundamentally in the mission of the NAACP and the moment of the 19, uh, uh, late 1940s um, is that they are pushing for something broader than just the U.S. And that right there is also one of the things that they have to step back from after they do the appeal. And so one of the strongest areas of the NAACP's uh, fight is the practice is the uh, ending the practice of lynching. Um, the Minneapolis NAACP was founded in 1914. One of our first notable cases uh, we were a part of in 1921 was the three lynching the the lynching of three black men in Duluth, Minnesota, where we provided legal fees for uh, also the two remaining black men who were founded uh, innocent of their crimes and let go later. So there was on trial five initially, three were lynched, two uh, the Minneapolis NAACP provided legal fees for. Um, and so the NAACP utilized a number of tactics to reach these goals of equality. And in the aftermath of World War II, they saw an opportunity in the new formation of the United Nations. And they, at that moment, in the appeal, saw their rights inextricably linked to the rights of all African peoples, and they organized as such uh, with the intention and the mind of fighting white supremacy and fighting with all African peoples, reminding themselves that without that, the uh, work of ending white supremacy in the U.S. would not happen. So that's one of the things that, you know, in fighting for in fighting for this appeal, the, uh, how do I say this? The uh, notions of communism do come up. And unfortunately, because of political, a lot of political um, pushback, you know, this is one of the first documents, uh, the appeal is really one of the first documents that African-Americans brought to, about the African-American plight to the UN. And here the NAACP was uh, advocating for a black voice at the table at the founding since the founding of the UN and the NAACP was trying and made I, I believe a calculated decision a calculated decision after this appeal to really take a step for black Americans to make, to focus on civil rights instead of focusing on human rights in order to win something instead of win nothing. One of the issues that kept coming up on writing the appeal for W.B. Du Bois and the um, scholars was they were critical of the UN's uh, jurisdiction and then also their enforcement of what, what would happen? What would happen? What could the UN really do after this? And so this of course is before the um, the We Charge Genocide and then the um, UN um, uh, uh, Conference on Genocide. And so that was convention. And so that was one of the things where they were lacking the real uh, international law framework that would really support and bolster their claim. They were, you know, the NAACP, they revised their, you know, the petition of the NNC, uh, the National Negro Conference, and then they really tried to push for this. And W.E.B. Du Bois, even after this, still pushed and pushed, even with uh, what we see with the weed uh, charge genocide. But this connection to communism really destroyed even the National Negro Conference. Um, the NAACP didn't want to go that way. They wanted to preserve the organization that they had built over uh, 40 years. And they wanted to preserve the fact that they are a grassroots organization, an organization where 
to be connected to communism could put the uh, basic members of black folk in America in positions of danger and dangerous situations. This was an hour when the FBI particularly was targeting and surveilled the NAACP and some of the lasting legacies of that surveillance live in the NAACP bylaws today, such as like only the branch secretary and the treasurer have access to our branch membership records. Nobody else can, not even the president. And we cannot give those records to government officials. Also, we cannot take money from any government entity ever in fear of corruption. So these are lasting um, policies that the NAACP has even today that is meant to subvert uh, surveillance, right? And I mean, they were right in a lot of ways to worry about uh, you know, the NAACP's legacy. Uh, particularly since, you know, decade, a uh, couple, you know, years later, Medgar Evers was assassinated, right? And so this is something where in the height of the Cold War, embarrassing the U.S. on the international scale was seen as treasonous, right? And fundamentally what Du Bois was doing, and this is me speaking as an activist, reading this as an activist, um, is fundamentally what Du Bois was doing was treasonous as to expose the American systemic racism and calling for the end of the country's racist practices is to call for the abolishment of the U.S. government as the U.S. government and all its institutions are founded upon the foundation of slavery and racial exploitation. You know, the FBI was astute to understand that in a time of decolonization and revolution around the world, to expose American racism was a call to action to overthrow the U.S. government. Now, that's not what I believe W.E.B. Du Bois was doing very furtively, ex explicitly, but I see it. And I see it and I call for activists today is that in this era currently that we live in, we cannot fall prey to wanting to uphold institutions that fundamentally still to this day thrive on our exploitation. And so, you know, the NAACP fell to the repressive political environment. The appeal never saw the impact or the intended goals that Du Bois sought to achieve. And, you know, I really fundamentally feel like for the NAACP at the time and from what I've seen, is their goals was to change the lives of Black people in the U.S. The goals of Ida B. Wells was to change the lives of Black people in the U.S. The core of the uh, civil rights movement, the core of the Black Lives Matter movement today is to change the lives of Black people in the U.S. and then around the world. The legacy of the appeal is that there's a story here of wanting to achieve something over nothing and which we can understand, but in wanting to achieve that something, they let go of the broader goals and obligations that they had, not just to Black Americans, but to all folks of African descent. And so one of the things that um, Carol Anderson says is civil rights, however, did not then and does not now have a, the language, the tools, nor the means to address systemic issues that haunt Black America. To go beyond the establishment of legal equality, to go beyond Brown, human rights had to be defined and fought for as the ultimate goal for Black equality. And, you know, that brings us really to today in what we mean by what we want from the new Black Lives Matter, new civil rights movement, new human rights movement. After the murder of Tamir Rice and Trayvon Martin, and I'll just say this, is that Trayvon Martin was the exact same age as me, almost. And so when you see me, you see a reflection of who Trayvon Martin could have be, could have lived into. And the Black Lives Matter movement organized not just locally, but internationally. The call that Black Lives Matter is not just a plea to be recognized, but a call to organize after the tragic deaths of Black, of innocent Black period. Uh, people. Mirroring the work of Ida B. Wells, organizers documented injustices, built community locally, internationally, and it should be seen as a success that Black people in the U.S., in, the, in Brazil, in France, and in the African continent saw Black Lives Matter movement and related to it and identified with it. It goes to show that there is a place and a hope for a broader coalition of African peoples to come together to organize from the ground up to work to abolish white supremacy.
human rights must be fought for and by black people, not just in the US, but globally. And it starts with local grassroots organization. The UN, unfortunately, is simply too far from the people, <laughs> uh, too far from the average day black person to really be very useful in this regard. Um, and black Americans, either way, fundamentally should not and cannot look towards the institutions that were fundamentally built upon our enslavement and exploitation to uh, save us. Today, there's a plethora of grassroots organizations who focus fundamentally on changing the lives of everyday Black people uh, across the world, uplifting, empowering, and organizing us within and outside institutions. And they are so crucial to be in this place. We are in a crisis. The youth of today do not have hope in, tr in traditional institutions, not in the NAACP, in traditional organizations, and that is fine. They are right to not trust us as we and those who have come before us have failed them, but we have to stop and we have to look towards them today as we're building our future. We put profits and institutions before people when people and lives should have always been the center of our work. And so I've seen the disillusionment that has led to despair in many of our communities, but it doesn't have to always be a disillusionment in human rights if it's a disillusionment in the UN process. I believe that everything that we need to thrive for equality, for building a future, we have inherently in our communities and we cannot further invest in methods and ideologies that were born out of colonialism western imperialism and white supremacy there's a chant that goes uh ain't no power like the power of people because the power of people don't stop now say it slower ain't no power like the power of the people because the power of people don't stop and that is more is true now more than ever and through utilizing media the way Ida B. Wells, the way William and Ellen Craft and Frederick Douglass did. We have to utilize media. We have to utilize our international conversations and connections. We have to utilize people power building. And that's the only way for our communities to really see a future where black people are centered and the lives of black people are centered in the work that we do. And we can do that for and on its own, but we also need to use the framework that the UN sets out. For me, it's the powerful human rights framework that we can also uh, utilize. And so, you know, lastly, I'll just say this is that in Article 1 and Article 3 of the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 1 goes, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Article 3 goes, everyone has a right to life, liberty, and the security of person. Sounds just like our constitution, everybody has the right for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in ours, right? These in the declaration might seem like far off hopes, particularly since they're unenforceable, um, or promises to those who do not enjoy these human rights, but I'm flipping the script and I'm saying it as a threat. And because I am free, I will be treated with equal rights and dignity, and I will have life, liberty, and my happiness by any means necessary. This is a declaration I implore all of you to take, not as a way, uh, a way promise or far off premise, but as a fact and a threat. When we're talking about our happiness, when we're talking about our lives, we understand that our us, we, people must come before institutions. And for Black people and what the appeal and what the We Charge Genocide petition and the Black Lives Matter movement show is that it is treasonous for Black people to fight unapologetically for the rights of Black people in America because fundamentally we are radical and our Please are destabilizing because the very foundation of American democracy and capitalism depends upon Black lives not mattering. And to say otherwise is to proclaim an overthrow and to proclaim a new world where Western institutions do not have the same power as they once did to craft and change our lives. And where white supremacy is not the center, but we are.
And we can only do it in my feel is in my feel is to do it we're using the language of human rights by any means necessary and it has to be everyone and everywhere because white supremacist capitalism is killing all of us and our earth we need proactive action preemptive measures to end racially motivated murders and we can do that together through a language of human rights first and so that's the end really of my presentation, but I just lastly, lastly, lastly say that here are some local organizations to support. The Emmett Till uh, family is rooted based in Minnesota. Emmett Till Legacy Foundation is based in Minnesota. They are still fighting for justice for the murder of Emmett Till. Um, maybe you heard the news just yesterday that in Mississippi, they said they would not per, uh, prosecute Carol Bryant for, uh, uh, falsely claiming that Emmett Till. Uh, uh, and so that's one of the, they are still fighting for justice. They still have bills on the table. Uh, a group of families that I work with in Minnesota called Family Supporting Families Against Police Violence have coalesced many of the families um, that have been impacted by police violence in Minnesota, um, particularly the families of Dante Wright, George Floyd, Philando Castile, Jamar Clark are members, but also family members of folks that we don't often talk about and we don't hear about, like Travis Jordan, Justin Tigan, and Brian Quinones. And they need our support right now, particularly during the trial of Kim Potter and the upcoming trials of uh, Derek Chauvin's accomplices in the murder of George Floyd, as well as pushing bills. Last, last year, they pushed nine bills at the state legislature, and only a couple of them were passed. And so that was one of the organizations that we really, since particularly they have a policy focus and they are the families directly impacted by police violence, they should always be who we are turning to for our future. Um, Communities Against Police Brutality, the Twin Cities Urban League is a historic legacy organization, the NAACP, I will say do not donate to us. Please sign up as a member. It is $30 a year, $10 if you are 20 or under, and we need members members and we need people who are willing to work um, more than we need your donations, particularly since the majority of donations go to the national NAACP, it does not go to us. Um, and then Minnesota teen activists are another group of young folk who are raising the call. Thank you. I know I really went, I really went a long time, but thank you so much for uh, this time. Thank you, Angela Rose, for uh, flipping the script and also for situating the, the petition along a um, historical lineage of uh, script flipping uh, and of black internationalism. Um, all right, we have uh, some time left for questions from our audience. Uh, and as questions are uh, starting to come in through the chat. Uh, okay, yeah, I see already something here, a question for uh, Doug, um, research in genocide studies today has formed a collective debate surrounding the concept of genocide as a structural systemic process. The current accepted legal definition of genocide does not recognize this idea of genocide as structural. Uh, would you say Lemkin's definition of gen genocide embraced this idea of genocide as structural? Also, did Lemkin's uh, push against the idea of genocide against Black Americans hinder the discussions of structural genocide? and thus delay the recognition of structural genocide. And Doug, maybe to that uh, question, I will also add uh, whether in your work into his personal papers, if you have seen uh, any reflections of him later after the um, petition uh, in him trying to reflect on how his own opposition to this petition has um, contributed to the politicization of, of, of the concept of genocide. This is um these are really good questions. Let me let me try to answer in a way that can set um can set uh, so, um, Professor Lovelace and and, and 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 future Professor Myers. Profe you know, professor comes from the word prophet. It means the profess, right? So Professor Lovelace and Professor Myers. Um so to the to the reflection part of this. I never saw anything in Lemkin's papers that was self-reflecting on how he contributed to the politicization of this. Um, he certainly knew, he, he certainly, he, did, he embraced politics. He didn't try to separate politics from the law. He just, he understood the law to be politics. Um, and he, you know, I don't know. I didn't, I don't have any good answers for that. 
um, and but very little self-reflection to the idea of the structural systemic part. What we have to remember here is that um, is that the, the major powers as they sat down at the negotiating tables were engaged in a very, very complicated process of writing their own genocides out of the law. And so that part that where, where Lemkin's first coalition of delegates, he writes, he writes in his memoirs, um, is the notes that he's taking, this is not his memoirs yet, this is his diary, that his plan is gonna be to, to develop a coalition of African and Middle Eastern delegates. And he says the African delegates are, represent the peoples upon whom genocide has been committed the longest and the most fiercest. And he's gonna assemble a, a coalition of them with putting them together with small states and former colonies to outmaneuver the great powers and force the, force the great powers to the bargaining table and then construct the facade where they could take credit for the genocide convention. So it's a very, very complicated dance of constantly presenting, allowing the US, the UK and the Soviet Union to claim the moral victory constantly, right? Where behind the scenes, they're the ones trying to undermine it. And, and the small states and former colonies are trying to promote it. So it's, a, it's, it's this fast diplomatic dance. So what's, what happens then is, is you know, there's this, this, this question of, is this, you know, this notion of like structural genocide and the structural destruction of a people, right? That's basically what Lemkin's talking about. Lemkin's not talking about mass murder. Right, that's not, that's only one way you can, you can commit genocide. He's talking about very, very complicated, the interaction of very, very complicated systems of oppression. And he views, you know, his views on this are nuanced and complicated. And there's no room in international law for nuanced and complicated. And there's especially no room for conversation on anti colonialism. Um, I mean, the Chinese delegation is like, yeah, outlaw genocide, outlaw genocide. The British have been committing it against us forever. So the, there's, there's whole parts of the delegation of that, of that document, but the mental element of genocide that is because the Chinese insisted on it, they would not sign it because they viewed that as, as, as a way of preventing the opium wars again, right? So that the forcing of opium on the Chinese population by the British. So that, that sort of, you know, that the legal text is, is carefully handwritten and the US lawyers, the American Bar Association, I mean, Senate panels, there's a whole set of, letters that we have from the UK archives and the British government that are still classified in American politics, but the British don't declassify them so we can see what the Americans are writing. They, they know that, the, that the, they're saying that even under the, the treaty that is passed, that, that, that this would be, you know, coming close to genocide. However, they view it as success because they created a law that they believe could not be applied to the case of uh, of African American you know, anti, anti uh, violence against African Americans today, so and 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 this, and Stalin did this for the people, you know, for starvation and so forth. So there's this complicated dance there where all of that nuance gets written out of the law, and you get a treaty that is designed to sort of not work, right? And that's the part which is so interesting to me is that for we charge genocide. This is gets to Professor Lovelace's um, his, his you know his presentation here is that there's, a, there's also a sort of a moral element to this. It's they, Patterson is no fool. He knows that they're, they're, this is a dead end politically, legally, right? In the UN, this is not going in. There's gonna be no international tribunal about for this. And he understands the moral the part, the moral part of this and the moral part is politics. And, and there's an audience and there's a role there for galvanizing movements. And then there's an international politics part of this. Um, and that's what's really important to me is that, that We Charge Genocide keeps all of that nuance of that conceptions of genocide, keeps it, right? It, it doesn't, doesn't you know, sort of flush it down the, you know, down the drain, keeps it and holds it there, right? And it's this, it, it, is, it is the first document in the 20th century history that attempts to really present a very carefully you know, examination of this genocide, of, of a genocide that takes place over the span of centuries. Is constantly changing, and actually, mass murder is not is not the central part of it, right? But the central goal is the construction of a system of oppression and domination, right? Uh, so forth. So maybe that lets maybe that opens up space for uh, Professor Lovelace and Professor Rose Myers to uh, to talk. But I, I don't know. I'll let you. I'll let you both decide if that it helps. So. We have another question. Um, 
that's directed for all the panelists. Um, uh, but uh, if anyone feels a particular uh, um, urge to response, that would be great. Um, how or whether the faith of marginalized groups um, around the world, but also in particular in the United States, uh, the faith in the UN and its ability to uh, offer uh, any substantial um, um, alleviation has diminished after the UN World Conference on Racism uh, in, in Durban in South Africa failed uh, to win ratification in the US. Yeah, so lot, lots to say about Durban and the long legacy of, of the Durban conferences. Um, we are now, we just celebrated uh, the 20th anniversary of the 2001 conference. Um, and, you know, I, I think that, I think that one of the challenges that we face today that, um, that Patterson and Du Bois and others face is just being very clear about the limitations of the United Nations in um, US-based discourse, right? So, so there was great xenophobia at the moment in the 1950s. To raise this question of human rights was to raise questions of foreign standards, and I'll put that in quotes, right? Um, today, there's still great um, resistance domestically to uh, raising human rights questions at home because this feels like for many Americans imposing foreign standards. Now we know that the US has uh, adopted a number of treaties, right? So the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, which helps to ground a lot of the conversations that we've seen at these world conferences on racism, um, but also ICCPR and um, 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 the Genocide Convention as well. And so, uh, with that understanding of the cultural politics around human rights, but also recognizing that when the U.S. adopts a treaty, it does have the same power uh, as federal law, I think that I, I think that we should be careful but thoughtful and use human rights to help frame a lot of these issues. Right. So one of the one of the issues that has emerged time and again at the Durban conferences is reparations, right? So reparations, um, um, we should have, we should feel good and we should press the reparations conversation, both domestically using US law, but then also using the, the human rights frameworks that have emerged um, because of the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination and then the debates that are happening just globally around this World Conference on Racism. That Article 1-4 and Articles 2-2 of ICER right, allow for reparative reform, that the 14th Amendment corresponds to this, right, that there's a World Committee, uh, that there's a World Conference, right, that is talking about ending uh, racial discrimination in part by re relying on reparations. I think the other part of this is that it, as we talk about mass killings, right? To say that um, shooting um, unarmed protesters um, with rubber bullets or tear gassing right? demonstrators, things that we've seen in lots of protests in places like Minneapolis, but you can think about Ferguson, right? You can think about many other cities across America, that these are not simply civil rights abuses, that these are human rights abuses and that the world is watching. And so that I think that the power here and, and the faith in the UN, it's not a faith that the UN is going to come, right, and save Black people in Minneapolis or Ferguson, but it's an understanding that we have tools to give language to our suffering, that we need to have a more sophisticated vocabulary about the violence that's happened to us. And I think that having that yardstick, right, having um, a world stage as the United Nations provides right, to dramatize our plights, I think that that's the critical intervention here. And so that, that's what gives me faith um, to continue to engage this human rights framework. Thank you. That's a, a really um, 
useful way to think about this. And, and Angela Rose, I want to bring you into this conversation also and ask you how you responded or how would you respond now to the person who asked you the title of your presentation? So for that moment, I definitely encouraged, uh, that was uh, particularly in a moment when the, it was before July uh, 2021, before the um, UN um, High Commissioner had, you know, made the statements toward, you know, their plan and recommendations. Um, and so it, it was a point of time where um, I wanted, you know, to, you want to keep hope alive, right? And how to do that is also with the framework of utilizing international attention to press uh, uh, for local change. So the goal is not necessarily to go through a UN facilitated, you know, Truth and Reconciliation Commission or something like that. Um, the goal is to essentially change the lives of Black Americans. And if that means you have to go through a truth and reconciliation, then you have to go through a truth and reconciliation. But if we could get pressure, particularly in a moment when we were trying to get bills passed in the state legislature, we were trying to get um, policy changed with the MPD, we were trying to get a tear gas model policy pushed, um, it was very sad and unfortunate that I was at the uh, I was at the funeral for Dante Wright, and I had to pull out my laptop to zoom in to the post board, the Police Officers Standards and Training Board Commission meeting, to push for a model policy on um, police response to public uh, First Amendment public assemblies, and to hear the organs in the background. And I'm in a side room. I'm like in a side room in the church at Shiloh. Temple uh, Ministries, uh, International Ministries in North Minneapolis to fight for something of a model policy that I had a petition with uh, 1,700 signatures on to push for change. It was, you know, that is the that is the realm of surrealism that activists work in today, you know, to try to organize for, you know, protections for black, uh, uh, you know, cultural sites in North Minneapolis while there's white supremacists in the streets and you're still arguing whether to essentially uh, convict the officers who were um, who were. <laughs> Who were uh, who were accomplices in the murder of George Floyd and in Dante Wright's um, murder to to fire the uh, woman Kim Potter? We went there every day, and so it was a surreal moment that we live in when it's um, crisis on the ground. And for us to trust the UN, it is more on how do we utilize international attention in this moment to pressure these people that we've been in rooms with. I've had conversations, I have their phone number and they are they are not budging, right? And it's to really show the world, you said, look, in Minnesota, we already know what you're about, but maybe you'll be forced to do the right thing if it's CNN and Don Lemon calling you out, or you know, if there's somebody tweeting about it who you respect rather than just the black people who've been told you the issues with the Minneapolis Police Department, the issues with the suburban cops, the issues with tear gassing um, protesters and limiting our First Amendment rights. And so maybe if you don't listen to us, we're gonna make you listen to the world. Thank you so much. Um, I think we could continue having this conversation for quite a while, and I certainly would want to, um, but we are out of time and I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. So I really wanna thank our three speakers for giving us so much to think about. Um, and thank you also everyone in the audience who joined us this evening. Um, this has been a, a really important and um, very insightful conversation. Um, thank you, everyone, and um, have a good night. Thank you.